Take me back to a preacher in a verse where they've seen me at my worst. There's nowhere else that I'd rather be Than dancing with you as you sing over me There's nothing else that I'd rather do Lord, than to worship you so rejoice, be glad, rejoice, O oh my soul, for the Lord your God, He reigns forevermore, I rejoice, for my God reigns. So rejoice, be glad, your Father and your friend is the Lord your God, whose rule will never end, I rejoice, for my God reigns. And my God reigns, and I dance the dance of praise. And my God reigns, with a shout I will proclaim. And my God reigns, and I worship without shame. And my God reigns. And I will rejoice, for my God reigns. There's nowhere else that I'd rather be Than dancing with you as you sing over me. There's nothing else that I'd rather do, Lord, than to worship you. So rejoice, be glad, rejoice, O oh my soul, For the Lord your God he reigns forevermore, I rejoice, for my God reigns. So rejoice, be glad, your Father and your friend is the Lord your God, whose rule will never end, I rejoice, for my God reigns, and my God reigns. And I dance the dance of praise, and my God reigns. With a shout I will proclaim, and my God reigns. And I worship without shame, and my God reigns. And I will rejoice, for my God reigns. And I will rejoice.
Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It, uh, it, it would appear that we, um, we may be, be a little understaffed this morning, um, which just, that, that just means everybody's going to have to sing that much louder. So why don't we all stand up this morning and we'll get going uh, the way we always do. This is the season for a new anointing. This is a season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now rise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now rise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory fill the earth. 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 This is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is a day, this is a day, this is a day that the Lord has made. King of glory, King of glory, fill the earth. King of glory, fill the earth. Good to see this many people here today. Uh, we have our teens, I think, on a retreat today. We have a holiday weekend, and we do want to honor and celebrate our veterans uh, in the military. Military, and, and so uh, we're glad that we get to do that. We're glad our our country and you know recognizes uh, the value of of people and um, the way they devote their lives to to service. And so, thank you, veterans. I know we have many in the congregation, so we thank you for doing that. I don't know if you recognized what you just sang. Were y'all paying attention to the words? Okay, I hope so. This is the day the Lord's made. I'll rejoice and be glad in. Uh, and also, uh, the idea that we want God to fill the earth with glory. And I think one of the ways he does that he's, is he fills us we are the temple of of god his holy spirit dwells within us and as we go into the world he is filling the world with his glory through us okay and so um the other part of that that i was i was thinking about is the season 
know, we go through seasons. We got a season, a fall season. We have November brings around Thanksgiving season, and uh, for some reason we we don't perhaps uh, we're not as as recognized as much as we do uh, this season about the things that we're thankful for. Uh, but anyway, uh, this reminded me of, of a verse, the season that we're in, and it's really longer than just a month or a day. Uh, it's, it's, it's much longer than that. But in, in John chapter, chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God repeat that I tell you the truth and so this is truth those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life that's us guys they will never be condemned for their sins but they have already passed from death into life and so we have already passed from death to the life we are living in a season of life not death but life and that's a wonderful thing, and that's why we can rejoice each and every day, no matter what circumstance. I think it says somewhere else, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for those of you who are in Christ. And so, uh, we have a season, not just a season, a monthly season, a daily season, we have a lifetime a season of life, and that's a wonderful thing, all because of God. Let's, uh, let's give thanks to him, and, and while I'm, I'm thinking about this, those prayer cards that are on the back, this isn't just when you have an emergency, a health issue, uh, a, a spiritual issue. This is also for giving thanks, and so as we're going through the service today, because Thanksgiving is a part of what we offer to God, if you see something or if you have something there and you Fill out that card of something that you're thankful for, maybe, and drop it in the box, and, and we'll pray with you uh, about that as well. And so, uh, our call to worship today is let's give God glory. Let's give him thanks. Let's give him praise. Let's, let's begin with a prayer. Lord God, you're the, you're the God of the universe. Uh, you're the God who made us. You're the God who loves us. You're the God who knows us personally. Uh, you know us as a group, and today we come. We come to honor you and give you praise and glory as we worship together. Thank you, Lord, for this day. In the name of Jesus, I offer this thanks. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up and continue our worship together. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain and as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. When all I see is a cross, God, you see the empty too. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. With every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. You go before us, nothing can stand against 
the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. With my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God. The battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. You know, I'm especially encouraged this morning. I, 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 we're supposed to be singing another song, but I'm going to talk instead. Um, I'm especially encouraged this morning. Uh, we got here this morning and we were, uh, we were practicing and... Um, my, my voice just was not where it needed to be at uh, at eight thirty this morning, and there's a reason for that. It's because I was uh, I spent Friday evening and most of the day uh, yesterday with uh, the youth who are not here today. Um, man, can I just say how blessed Hunter Hills is to have Stephen and Paige? Good grief. Um, when you see them, you need to you need to thank them. Um, but also, man, how blessed is Hunter Hills to have some of the teens that we have? I I, I was um, I was encouraged at uh, the leadership that we have within that group. Uh, a couple of the guys, um, uh, I, I I don't know. I just um, but man, so there were ni nineteen kids. I started that trip in Courage because we pulled up to lead and there were 19 kids. I didn't know we had 19 kids in the youth group. There were 19 kids there, guys. And, and when we sang, you'd have thought there were 35, 40 kids. They loved to sing. We sang songs that I didn't even know they knew. We sang Prince of Peace. When's the last time we sang Prince of Peace? Right? I, I just, I don't know. I was really encouraged. Guys, I, I hope... I hope you know that we got a strong group of leaders headed our way. Um, okay, yeah, I digress. Let's sing. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone. on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. Never once did we ever walk alone, and never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful, and you are faithful, God, you are faithful. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say. Yes, our hearts can sing. Never once did we ever walk alone. And never once did you leave 
on our own. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Evermore we are breathing in your grace. And evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. And you are faithful, God, you are faithful. You are faithful, God, you are faithful. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Good morning, Hunter Hills. Over the last few years, I've been trying to read uh, more of, I guess, what we would call uh, Christian classics. Will got me thinking about that a little while back, so I've been trying to read um, some more books uh, that have really helped um, shape theology and uh, Christian thought and the way that we do church. Now, some of these some of these theologians of the past are not perfect with everything, always got to check what they say against Scripture. So if they make a mistake, you can say, I appreciate the work you put into that, but I'm, I'm going to disagree on that one. But other times, they really hit the nail on the head, and you think, man, yeah, that aligns with Scripture really well. Never thought about it that way before. So um, so I want to read uh, this morning out of uh, something, a passage on communion that Martin Luther wrote uh, back around 1519 or so that I thought was, was really good in explaining the Scripture and changed the way I thought about communion. Um, so Luther begins explaining what communion is, and he starts with the text of Scripture. He says, the words of Christ in which he instituted the Lord's Supper are these. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you. For this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. So Luther starts his analysis of what this means by saying, by focusing on the word testament. You know, our, our you know, translations can sometimes translate that as covenant, but they, they pretty much mean the same thing. Luther says, a testament, as everyone knows, is a promise made by one about to die in which he designates his bequest and appoints his heirs. Christ testifies concerning his death when he says, this is my body which is given and this is my blood which is poured out. He names and designates his bequest when he says, for the forgiveness of sins. So again, I'm about to die. What am I giving you? Forgiveness of sins. And he appoints the heirs when he says, for you and for the many. So this, this great gift of I'm about to die, I'm about to give you forgiveness of sins. Who is it for? It's for you. That is, for those who accept and believe the promise of the testator. For here, it is faith that makes men heirs, as we shall see. Now, pulling it all together, he says, You see, therefore, that what we call the Lord's Supper is a promise of the forgiveness of sins made to us by God, and as such, a promise that has been confirmed by the death of the Son of God. Then he goes on to say, According to his substance, therefore, the Lord's Supper is nothing but the aforesaid words of Christ, take and eat, etc., as if he were saying this, Behold, O sinful and condemned man, out of the pure and unmerited love which I have for you, and by, will, by the will of the Father of mercies, Apart from any merit or desire of yours, I promise you in these words the forgiveness of all your sins and life everlasting. And that you may be absolutely certain of this irrevocable promise of mine, I shall give my body and pour out my blood, confirming this promise by my very death, and leaving you my body and blood as a sign and memorial of this promise. As often as you partake of them, remember me, proclaim and praise my love and bounty for you, and give thanks." Now, he went on to say some other things about uh, the, the real presence in the Lord's Supper that I'm not sure he was right about, but everything that we read, I think, was really good. How, I don't know about you guys, uh, until I read this, I didn't really think about communion as, as uh, you know, a promise of the forgiveness of sins. Instead, just thought, all right, you do it in remembrance of Christ, you do it because he said so. Um, but I don't know about you guys, I've been a Christian for a long time, and I'm still kind of a mess. <laughs> really am. Uh, I don't have it all figured out. I don't have uh, my game completely together, and I wish I did, but it's, it's not going to happen on this side of heaven. Um, so if you're here today and you're in a similar situation, you know, hopefully you understand what the cross of, of Jesus means, but if you're like me every once in a while, 
you know, whether, whether overtly or subtly, you find yourself thinking, could Jesus forgive me? And what we're about to take here in communion is a promise, yes, yes I can. Why? Because Jesus went to the cross for us. All, all of the punishment that we deserve for all of our sins, he took on his body. His blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. His body was broken, so ours wouldn't have to be because of our sin. So if you find yourself thinking, you know, could God forgive me? Could, could Christ forgive me in spite of what I've done? Then approach the table today and give thanks. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, because I know I don't deserve this, but thank you for going to the cross to buy that forgiveness for me. If you come to the table today and, you know, you're taking it for granted and maybe there's some unconfessed sin before you take, well, this is a good time to say, you know what, Lord, in light of what you've done, I can't keep doing this. Forgive me and thank you for your forgiveness. But regardless, um, let's, give thanks to, let's give thanks to the Lord for uh, sending his son to die for us. Lord, we know that if it were just up to us, we couldn't make it. We know that it is written, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and that's all of us. But Lord, we thank you, not because of what we've done, but because of your great love that you sent Jesus to bear the punishment that we deserved, to die and to rise again to forgive our sins. So as we approach the table, we give you thanks. Thank you for the love that you sent. For uh, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as we take this promise of forgiveness of sins, help us to believe it and help us to take it to heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I am strong, and let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see, it's what the Lord has done to me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. To the river I will wade. There my sins are washed away from the heavens mercy stream of the Savior's love for me, and I will rise from water deep into the saving arms of God. I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let's sing that again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am 
say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. It's what the Lord has done in me. Amen. Will's going to come up here. I'm going to go ahead. Uh, if you have a child ages three years old to kindergarten, there's a special place, a special time of worship learning. Miss Kelsey is going to be with them today. Not my cousin Kelsey, the second coolest Kelsey here at Hunter Hills. She oh, will be. No, sorry. Um, she will be with your kids. It's going to be a great time. Three years old to kindergarten. You can just make their way out the back and she'll get you where you need to go. Good morning, church. I am the coolest Will here because I'm the only Will. So uh, nobody named Will. No, I'm not the only Will. Shoot. Is he here? Will Strength? He is? Where is he? He's not in this. I'm the coolest Will in this room. <laughs> Second coolest in this church. Have a couple of announcements uh, before we dig in this morning. Oh, welcome to everybody. So glad you're here. Um, <clears throat> uh, Corey stole one of my announcements, which is 19 kiddos at, uh, at the youth retreat. That's an awesome thing. Uh, and I can't say it better than Corey said it. Uh, but we praise God for that. Uh, and my my oldest is one of the newbies there, and Tanner's oldest is one of the newbies there. Such a comfort to know uh, not only Stephen and Paige, but that group of older teens they've got that, uh, for my boy to look up to, and next year my daughter. So it truly is a blessing. Uh, be thankful. Um, next week, we're gonna do, me and Stephen are going to do a Q&A again in the back, so if you have any questions about the faith, uh, the Bible, life, whatever, feel free to come back after service next week. And we'll talk about that back there, uh, especially you young folks. If there's things you're hearing and you're like, wait a minute, I don't know if that makes any sense. Um, you, it doesn't matter your age. You can come back there and talk with us. We'd love to, to try to figure some things out as best that we can. And then finally, put on your calendar, December 1st is our annual unity singing with uh, Landmark, Vaughn Park, and Grace Point. December 1st, 6 p.m., that's a Sunday, 6 p.m. at Grace Point this year. Now, that's a drive, all right? So... If anybody wants to carpool there, let me know, because that is a drive. That's a 40-plus minute drive. Um, but it's going to be wonderful this year. It's a smaller sanctuary, and so we're all just going to be packed in there, and the singing is just going to be incredible. So uh, make your plans to join us for that. This morning, we're beginning a series on the book of Ruth, and the plan is to spend three weeks in the book of Ruth, and then we'll begin our Advent season on December 1st. If you haven't read the book of Ruth lately or ever, I encourage you to do so. It is a uh, beautiful book. It's not very long. You could probably read the whole thing in less than 20 minutes. If you're a slow reader like me, it could take you 30 plus, uh, but a very, very short book. But it's a beautiful story about faithful love. It's a story about loyalty. Um, most importantly, God's loyalty to us. That's what the story is really about. Just like we've seen as we've been talking about marriage the last few weeks, that the mystery of the man and the woman becoming one flesh, the mystery is really about Christ and the church. It's the same for the story of Ruth. It's ultimately a story about God's faithful love to his people. And so it is a story with a happy ending. But that's not where the story begins. The story begins in kind of the most dire situation that you could find yourself in, especially that a woman could find herself in, in the ancient world. Let's pray, and then we'll dig into that. Pray with me. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, you have rescued us out of darkness, and you have brought us back from the world and the devil. You have purchased us with the blood of your son. And this, Father, is the great story of history. Lord, you alone know truly the heartbreak in this room today. You see every one of us. You know each one of us intimately inside and out. You know our stories. You see the ups and the downs in each one of us. Lord, you see this morning those who are happy and full of hope. And you see those who are very near to despair. And we humbly ask you, Lord, for your help in joy and in sorrow, that we would never lose sight of your story. While at the moment the story of our lives might be sorrowful, your story of redemption is secure. It cannot fail. 
and it is full of joy inexpressible. Help us, Lord, to look with hope at this great story of redemption. Give us eyes to see that story in the book of Ruth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The book of Ruth is a story that comes from the period of the judges. That's what verse 1 tells us, Ruth 1.1. 1, 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So I want to take a minute and just trace how we get from the beginning of Genesis to the judges so that we're set up to understand what we're reading. First thing, uh, God created man and woman, and they lived in his presence, and they lived under his law. That's the first thing. There was an enemy who came into that place to deceive them, and he was effective in turning their hearts away from God and toward him and his ways. And man and the woman, they sinned against God, and they were justly exiled from his presence, cast out of the holy place where they no longer belonged, and cast into the world, cast into the darkness, cast into the domain of the evil one. But God, seeing what had happened, already had a plan to redeem them. That is to buy, to purchase them back from Satan and from the world and to turn their hearts back to God. And this plan of redemption, this plan of redemption begins with Abraham. God called Abraham out of the country where he was living and he brought him to a land and then he promised that his descendants would possess that land one day. And of course, we're talking about what is now the land of Israel and what was the land of Israel. God blessed Abraham because of his faith, because of his faithfulness to leave that country based on a word from God. He blessed him and Abraham had a son named Isaac. And all the promises that God had made to Abraham, God made those same promises to Isaac. And then Isaac had a son named Jacob. And all the promises that God had made to Abraham and Isaac, he made to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and these sons would become the heads, the fountain of the 12 tribes of Israel. One of his sons was named Joseph. Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery and on that journey, he ended up in the land of Egypt where God blessed him. You see a theme here? God blessed him and he became a prominent leader in Egypt so that when a famine came through the land, he was set up to help his brothers and his father. Hearing that there was grain in Egypt, his father and his brothers eventually moved to Egypt where there's plenty of food. And there in Egypt, God blessed them. They were fruitful. They multiplied greatly in Egypt. This went on for hundreds of years until a king rose up who didn't know Joseph and who uh, felt some kind of way about how big these people were in the land. And so he enslaved them and made life very bitter for them. They spent 400 years in Egypt, and God blessed them. Through a series of events, God calls Moses through the burning bush to call the people out from Egypt uh, the Egyptians, the Pharaoh, the king, he wasn't too happy about that. Then you get the ten plagues, and the people of God end up going through the Red Sea on dry land, and they end up at Mount Sinai where God gives them a law and establishes a covenant between them. A covenant. Here's how the covenant goes. God says to the people, if you will obey my law, and especially if you will worship the one true God, if you'll worship me and me only, I will bless you. Things will go well. You'll have plenty of food, plenty of babies. Everything's going to be wonderful. If you break my law, and especially if you go and worship other gods, the gods of the peoples around you, I will curse you. There will be famine, and there will be sickness in the land. That's the covenant. And the people agreed to it. They said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They felt very confident. Uh, it was a matter of days before they broke it. Moses dies. Joshua leads the people into the promised land. And he allots different areas to each of the 12 tribes. When Joshua dies, this great leader who led them into the promised land, when he dies, the people of the land start to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, and they worshiped false gods. They broke this covenant. And so true to his word, God cursed them. 
He sold them into the hand of their enemies, and things just went terribly. One of these enemies was Moab. Remember that name. When the people of Israel were suffering and crying out to God and repenting of their false worship and their sin, God always heard them, and he raised up what was called a judge to save them. The judge typically would lead them in battle, and it was a gift from God to bring them out of enslavement and into a time of blessing. And then they would do it all over again. They would worship false gods again. God would curse them again. They would return in repentance. God would bless them and raise up a judge and bring them back. And on and on and on it goes. And so the book of Ruth sits in this time frame, the time of the judges, this up and down, this blessing, and then this curse. Now, which part of the cycle do you think Ruth, Naomi, Elimelech, which part of the cycle do you think they're in? Is it a time of piety and blessing? Or is it a time of rebellion and cursing? Let's look at verse 1 again. Ruth 1.1, 1, 1, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. There's our first clue about what part of the cycle Naomi and Elimelech are on. Famine, hunger, thirst. These are all mentioned among the curses that God would send when the people break covenant. If you want to read about those, Deuteronomy 28 through 32. You see the blessing and the cursings of the covenant. Famine is mentioned a couple times. The author is telling us that this family is leaving Israel at a time when Israel was worshiping false gods, at a time when they stood under the wrath of God. Let's keep reading. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, this is the ultimate low point. <laughs> Not only are they starving in the promised land, but the only way to survive is to go across the Dead Sea into a country of enemy territory. These are people who have wounded, who have enslaved the people of Israel, but they have no other choice. This is where they have to go. Uh, if you'll put up that map, it'll show you. You probably can't read that. The pink thing is Moab. Right across from the sea is Bethlehem. So this is where they have to go, outside of the promised land, just to survive. Verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech. Elimelech means God is my king. We're tuned into this idea that Elimelech is a faithful man, probably. And the name of his wife Naomi. Naomi means pleasant, delightful. And the names of his two sons were Machlon, which means sickness, and Kilion, which means failing. We don't think like this today, do we? To name our children in ways that represent what's going on at the time they're born. These are both names, Machlon, Kilion. These are both names that come out of the cursing passages in Deuteronomy 28 and 29. I want to show that to you real quick. Uh, look at Deuteronomy 29, 22. Speaking in the context of cursing, God says, And the next generation will say, when they see the afflictions of that land and the sicknesses with which the Lord has made them sick. This is Machlon. Why has the Lord done this to the land? Then people will say, it is because they abandoned the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers. Machlon comes from this word sickness. Now look at Deuteronomy 28, 64. Again, in, the, in this context of cursings. And the Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other. And there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you shall find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes, failing kilion, and a languishing soul. 
So I'm guessing these two boys were born in the middle of a famine. I'm guessing Elimelech and Naomi, their whole lives have been in a famine. And also, perhaps these two boys who don't live that long, perhaps these are frail boys. Perhaps they're, boy, they're undernourished boys. And so their parents named them after just this is the situation. We're under the curse of God. And so they named them sickness and they named them failing. And if so, Naomi's suffering at this point is doubled. There's not enough food for her boys, and they're already so weak. And she and Elimelech have to do something desperate, and so they flee to enemy territory in the hopes that maybe there they can survive. This is where Naomi's at. The text goes on. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. Here is more sorrow added to Naomi. Her husband dies, her friend, her companion. And at this time, more so than it is today, still is today, but more so than it is today, her provider is gone. What she is feeling about Elimelech, by the way, is what all of Israel is feeling during this famine. They have chased after other gods. They have looked outside of the one true God for their provision. And these gods cannot provide. That is their punishment. God gives them over to these gods. And what you see is these gods are cruel. These gods have nothing good to give. The New Testament tells us these gods are demons. They're not your friend. This is how all of Israel feels, left without their provider, hopeless and helpless, and this is how Naomi feels. Thankfully, however, Naomi has two sons, and maybe even though they're, they're frail and weak, sick, uh, maybe they can still provide for her and take care of her. They each marry And Naomi, after these marriages, can expect grandchildren. And okay, now we're getting back to the blessing part. Verse 4. These boys took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, which means stubborn. And the name of the other, Ruth, which means friendship, companion. They lived there about 10 years, and both Machlon and Kilion died. And so the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And then when we get to verse 6, where do we find Naomi? She's working in the fields. She's a field hand or she is trying to pick up the scraps left over from the harvest. Either way, she is in a very hazardous place. As we will see throughout the book of Ruth, the fields are not a great place to be because Wicked men go to the fields looking for weak women. And so Boaz has to tell his people, don't you touch Ruth. It's a, it's a hard place to be. It's a hazardous place to be. Naomi is kind of a Job figure, isn't she? But in four chapters, not in 40-something chapters. But she is kind of like a Job. Her lot in life is a tough one. And lastly, I want to show you how she thought about her life. You know, there's the things that happen to us, and then there's how we cope with it. There's how we think about it. It's what we make of it. And I want to show you how she thought about it. And I'm not making a theological argument here, but I do want you to see Naomi's theology, which I think is shared uh, by many in the Old Testament. Look at Ruth chapter 1 and verse 13. She's speaking to Orpah and to Ruth, and she said, It is exceedingly bitter for me, to me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And then listen to what she says when her and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. This is what she says. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem, and when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? Is this the pleasant 
one. And she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. She went away with her family, and she has to come back with none of them. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? On top of all this, she thinks, God's doing this to me. This suffering is from him in some way. I'm going to do a very cruel thing to you today, and we're going to leave the story right there. And there's a reason for that. And it's because many of us are in this part of the story right now. And if you're not, you will be in the part of the story where you can't see the happy ending. You can't see what will come of it. In the coming weeks, we will see God's loving kindness But this is what I want us to see today. This is how I encourage you to think about these things today. There are little stories, and then there is one big story. Little stories, and then one big story. All of Scripture is filled with one little, a bunch of little stories that all tell us about the one big story. Your life is a little story, and as image bearers, God is looking, and he wants your life to be a story that points to this one big story. You know, we've been talking about marriage for the past several weeks, and one of the most amazing truths that the scriptures teach us about marriage is that your marriage, my marriage, are little stories, and the point of these little stories is not me and not Brittany. The point of these little stories is the big story, the mystery, Paul says. The two shall become one. Adam and Eve join together, cleave together, never leave each other. This, Paul says, is a great mystery. It's a secret. There's something hidden inside marriage. What is it? He says, it's Christ and the church. That's what's hidden. It's the same with the story of Ruth, brothers and sisters. It's the same with your life. It's a mystery. There's something hidden inside of it. Naomi and Ruth are just a little story. I mean, when you think about the great Old Testament stories, even then, we all love Ruth. But it's it's a pretty little story. It only gets four chapters. They are only two generations among countless generations. This story is not handed down to us. For the sake of Naomi and Ruth. It's not the story's not handed down to us so that you can uh, stop being curious about Naomi and Ruth. That's not the point. The story is handed down to us because of its resemblance to the great story of Scripture, which again is Christ and his church. This is why Jesus can say to the experts in the scriptures. In John 5, 39, he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. In all of the scriptures are little stories, little things that God uses to communicate this one big story, which is Christ and his church. Turn anywhere in the Old Testament, and you will see a small story that points to this bigger story of Christ and his church. Why is this important? I think this is really important because this is the same for your life. It's the same thing with your life. Because you were made in the image of God, it is God's design that your life be a little story that imitates and points to this one big story. And that does not mean a life of constant happiness. A life that tells the story of Christ and his church 
is not a life of pure bliss. Look at Naomi. Where we leave her this morning, she is a broken woman. Every man in her life is gone. and She has no one to provide for her. And so she's reduced to hazardous field work. And on top of that, she believes that this is God's testimony against her. He's punishing her, she thinks. And those of us who know this story, we know chapter 4 is coming. We see the happy ending. Naomi doesn't know the end of the story. Not at this time. She doesn't know. She's like you and me. She's inside her story, and she cannot see the end of her story. And that's very frustrating, and there's a lot of pain there when you don't know how it's going to turn out. And especially some of you just keep getting smacked over and over and over again. And you're saying, where's the end of this story? When? How long, O Lord? And American Christianity has a dangerous habit of pretending like every little story has a happy ending. But it doesn't. We're not promised that. In fact, every little story ends in death 100% of the time. This is why those of you who are living for your little story, if that's the be-all, end-all point of your existence is your little story, you are going to be knocked out flat when suffering comes. That's not the story that you were intending. All your hope and trust is in the outcome of your little story. But friend, I hope you have a perfect life. But even if you don't have a perfect life, I mean, I hope you do. Even if you do have a perfect life, it's going to end in death. What then can we do? We can ask God to help us see the big story. This is what we're intended to do, to live for the big story. You see, when the story of our lives is over, those of us who are in Christ will be taken up into this big story. And we will see how every point in our lives, the sorrow and the joy, all of it, God has used for his big story. What better kind of life is there? You might be where Naomi is, sorrow upon sorrow. They keep getting piled on top of you and, and your story looks dark. And if you are living for your story, it's easy to give up at a time like this. And by give up, I mean not suffer. I mean give up means to turn totally inward up to yourself, to turn away from God, to turn away from people, to turn away from the work God's called you to. But brothers and sisters, if you live for the big story, then you can live at all times knowing that at the end of it all, there will be happiness and restoration at levels we can't even possibly imagine here today. So my encouragement is, ask God to help you see the big story. You're not going to understand how this moment in your life is a part of God's big story, but we take it on faith that it is. And every moment matters. Every moment, God is doing something for his great story of redemption. If that's where you are this morning and you need people to gather around you, let me rephrase that. If that's where you are this morning, you need people to gather around you. You do. Because this story, uh, it turns out, is very hard to believe when you're just on your own. When all you can see is the sorrow, it's very hard to remember this big story and believe this big story. So you need people. You need church. I was thinking uh, while we were worshiping, while we were taking communion, I was like, all we're doing is rehearsing the big story. That's, that's all we're doing. We're singing about what God has done for his people. We're just rehearsing the big story. When I took the bread, which is the body of Christ given for me, I'm just rehearsing this great big story because it is so hard to believe that I need bread, I need juice, 
I need the body and the blood there. I need songs of praise. I need brothers and sisters who believe the story today because it might be hard for me today to believe it, and I need you around me. Say, let's look at the big story. Your little story is not invalid. Your suffering is not invalid, but it is just a little story. Let's think for a little while about all that God is doing. So you need people around you. Fill out a prayer card, please, and call the troops. Call them to your side, and we will be there to pray with you when you're not around, to hug you when you are, to pray with you when you are around, to speak words of hope about this great big story. And we want to close today by singing about this big story. The praise team can go ahead and and come on up as we get ready for this. If you are struggling to remember the big story and to count it as more important than your little story, then my advice to you is sing with all your heart. Singing is fighting. I don't know if I've ever said that before. Singing is fighting. Fighting to sink your faith into these things. We don't sing because our hearts are overflowing with faith. We sing because we want our hearts to be overflowing with faith. Singing out loud this great story is is our way of our hearts reaching out and grabbing these realities and storing them in our hearts. And actually, I think it's not really something you can do by listening. It's something we do by actually singing, although listening sometimes is fine. But it's singing is where you do the work of fighting for these things to see the big story, to help you endure the small story, to make it real in our hearts. And so if you want that kind of faith this morning to see the big story, to live for the big story, to hope in the big story and never give up, then let's stand and let's fight for that by singing this great story. All my words fall short. I have got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, because all that I have is a high. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one move, with my arms stretched wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing Hallelujah. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song.
song Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs Get up and praise the Lord So I throw up my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I have nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. We're going to sing another song. I'm going to boot. I feel very trapped with this in front of me. It's just a ginormous barrier in my way. Let's sing this one out. Uh, just a, I mean, you, you, you can't even, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Come on, let's, let's sing it together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ is my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Praise the one who 
set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Give me the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Christ, my living Let's sing it again. Let's sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Oh, hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. today with that song. That's really great. It feels sort of like um, the story that Paul Harvey used to, you know, the rest of the story. Okay, you're going to have to come next week and hear the rest of the story because I tell you, that first part is pretty rough. Um, anyway, um, but we just sang about the end and that is what's so encouraging. And we're going to encourage each other one more time with this, uh, this verse here. Let's, let's say it together. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belongs to God, that we may praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. Go with God. <laughs>